Welcome to this HRD podcast. We're joined today by Mike Ruddle, Director at Capita Talent Consulting. How are you, Mike? I'm very good, thanks. How are you? Very well, thank you. So, Mike, can you tell me why uh, you feel organisations with an inclusive culture tend to perform better? Yeah, sure. Um, Inclusion is about creating an environment in which people feel involved, respected, valued, connected, basically able to bring their authentic selves to the team and to the business. So, uh, for me, I think there's um, companies with an inclusive culture tend to benefit in several ways, actually. Um, firstly, uh, I would say innovation. Because um, inclusive teams tend to value and utilize the different strengths and contributions of every team member equally, that, that essentially enables them to exploit the power of diverse thinking, which is good for creativity um, and innovation. A diverse workforce can give an organization a huge creative potential. Um, as our experiences tend to influence the way we see a problem and, and, and the solution we come up with. So, in fact, you know, the more diverse the team, the more ideas are usually put forward and the greater the chances that you'll come up with the best possible outcome. Of course, I think also the opposite applies, um, where you have a workforce that only employs the same sort of person over and over. Um, that type of workforce um, will just tend to deliver more of the same old attitudes and solutions to problems again and again. Uh, and as such, I would argue that's not a workforce that's, li- that's likely to see much in, in terms of the way of innovation. I-, I think the second main point is around engagement and productivity. So um, employees who feel equally valued and included, irrespective of their individual differences uh, or backgrounds, tend to be more engaged. And I think you know most people would agree that high levels of engagement lead to high levels of productivity and collaboration. So in the type of environment where people can be their authentic selves, they're much more likely to be able to demonstrate their full value, be encouraged to be the best they can be, regardless of age, gender, disability, or nationality. Um, and, I'd, and I'd say that such a meritocratic view drives a high performance culture where everyone is given an equal opportunity to progress Um, and are rewarded and promoted based on performance alone. And I think that's really important. Um, The third key reason, I'd say, is around improved attraction and retention. So um, you're more likely to discover the most suitable skills and experience if you open yourself up to a diverse pool of candidates. Um, In contrast, employers um, that tend to limit diversity parameters effectively limit the number of candidates they can consider and therefore their ability to fill roles with the very best person for the job. And, and the increasing mismatch between the skills that employers need and those available continues to affect the ability of business and the economy to grow to its maximum potential. Um, one obvious solution to addressing these skill shortages is to take advantage of the flexibility that a diverse talent pool offers. And actually, a diverse workforce sends a really strong message to future candidates that your organisation has a truly inclusive working environment, thus helping you to become known as an employer of choice. Um, And and I think, you know, that 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 aspect of being an employer of choice can be a very effective differentiator to attracting key talent in the candidate market. When diversity programs are undertaken in an environment, you know, without an inclusive culture, you tend to get a range of siloed, disconnected activities and and they tend to be very low impact because they're not part of a broader, more cohesive strategy. And the strategy piece is really important. It needs to be supported by leadership who have implemented the right kind of structural and cultural components that are needed to sustain momentum and progress. And and most importantly, I think, a strategy where the wider employees in a broader sense clearly understand the context, the benefits, and the expectations of them and their role in helping to create inclusivity. What other practical changes are needed to move forward and embrace diversity and inclusion in the workplace? It's a big area. There's lots of things to, to consider. I mean, you know, despite the compelling evidence supporting the business case for DNI, and there's, there's countless studies out there now that, that support um, the fact that diversity and inclusion done well is good for business performance, there are still lots of common issues exist that I would argue really stifle progress with diversity and inclusion for many organisations. Um, the first one I'd say is that diversity and inclusion is viewed primarily as a compliance issue um, and the response when that's the case is, is a range of disconnected low, in, low impact activities as I just alluded to before and, and really that basically amounts to nothing more than box ticking. So to change that, to, to, to make the shift, it's absolutely essential that you need to nail your own why and your reasons for doing it. The business case for DNI is likely to be predicated on all sorts of different drivers for different organisations. 
So accelerating and sustaining progress requires basically a compelling underlying business driver. So I guess the, the practical point there is, is, is really about finding your why as an organization. The second point um, is that it still tends to be, DNI still tends to be regarded as mainly as a gender issue with the focus um, kind of mainly on leveling out gender ratios, you know, things like we need more women in leadership positions, et cetera, et cetera. And I think when that's the case, in isolation, this really only addresses the symptoms rather than the root causes of gender imbalance, which actually you know, stem from cultural aspects and, 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 and conscious and unconscious bias operating within the organization. So I think organizations really need to view diversity and inclusion through a wide-angle lens. It's, it's really not just about the women. Um, and, but to avoid alienating some other minority or underrepresented groups in the organization when initiatives are focused in one area over another, I think companies need to think really carefully about the way they communicate the strategy uh, and the activities they're doing in a very clear and transparent way. Um, I think uh, another issue would be around um, understanding the concept itself, actually. So I think organizations need to think about um, practical steps that they should be taking to educate their, their people's understanding of the subject matter and to broaden their perspectives so that their people can understand the role they can play in helping to build an inclusive culture. Um, and I think that's, that is a, a, a really important point. There, w there was a time when DNI programs were pretty much top down, um, but to deliver real impact and sustainability, I think everyone needs to buy, and at the end of the, at the end of the day, leadership set the direction, but it's the rest of us that have a very, very key role in actually making it happen. Um, and, and there are, I mean, I've just picked out a few there, but for, for me, I think probably the one I'd settle on, the point I'd settle on is to say, you know, ultimately, I think it's about having that clear rationale for change supported by strong communications. People have to understand the why, and they have to believe in it. And the business case has to be specific to the organization because it's, it's definitely not a one-size-fits-all approach. It's got to resonate with the leaders as well as those for, responsible for implementing and delivering the strategy, such as line managers, and the wider employees who have that very important role, as I said, to play in helping the organization make that required shift. What are the practicalities of embarking on that journey? That's a really good question because practical is good um, and is important. I think um, in terms of shifting the culture towards inclusion and, and helping to get the leaders on board in the first place, as I've mentioned before, I really like the, the idea of the cross-company approach, in, involving everybody in a collaborative way to get their views. I think it's really important to have a very, very strong sense of where your organization is currently in the overall journey to, to building cultural inclusivity and also what you, where your starting point is. To do that effectively, you, you have to involve your people. You have to generate a breadth and depth of perspectives concerning the organization's culture and their views about the culture and their aspirations for an improved, uh, more inclusive cultural state. So at a very practical level, I think the first thing you need to do is properly assess your current situation. And, and what that means essentially is undertake a process of data gathering and analysis. So in addition, um, to evalu evaluating your your organization's existing hard and quantitative data. And what I mean by that are things like metrics on the composition of the workforce, understanding the landscape of any existing diversity activities going on within the organization, such as employee resource groups, um, reviewing your core people processes and decision-making practices. So in addition to all of that, I think it's really important to evaluate some of the soft and the qualitative data too. So this would be things like um, data from your employee engagement survey um, and a review of the questions themselves actually that you're asking in the first place um, and undertaking a, a diverse range of focus group activity with minority groups or underrepresented communities to obtain that deeper level of understanding as to your people's perception of your culture specifically as it relates to inclusion. And one of the things that we found works really well just generally um, is, is doing actually doing an inclusion focused culture climate type survey because when you add and analyze the output of that type of data with all of the other data gathering activities I mentioned above that's going to put you in a really good place in terms of understanding um, your starting point and, and that provides an invaluable baseline from which you can measure your progress moving forward when you deliver the strategy and all of that stuff is really essential to informing the business case and to increasing leadership commitment and, uh, uh, and securing future investment investment for your DNI program. 
So the, the benefit of doing your homework and investing the time in data gathering is ultimately going to help um, inform your compelling why. Um, I definitely wouldn't adv advocate cutting corners on that. Truly understanding where you are on the journey is really critical. Um, the very final kind of point I'd make in terms of real practicality stuff, it's been, this is something I've experienced personally actually, but sometimes there is a need to provide education to the leadership as well because they don't always have a consistent level of understanding and awareness of the subject matter. So you, you, you might, um, it might be worth considering actually um, if, if you believe that to be the case in your organization, thinking around how you can bring your leadership team the, uh, up to that level of, uh, of understanding. Um, because, you know, the benefits of working with leaders and managers around inclusive leadership and unconscious bias, it really enables them to appreciate the subject matter and, and actually in turn will help them to role model the right behaviours um, you know, at that leadership level, which will send a very, very strong signal to the employees that you know, the leaders genuinely believe in the subject. Mike, what approach can you take to change culture? Oh, that's a big question. You can't just do culture change, your organisation. Um, culture basically arises from beliefs and the underlying assumptions that are held by people in the organisation. So trying to change culture by decree or, or just simply through training programmes and, and things like that just won't affect people's beliefs. I think um, probably the best way uh, to quickly and effectively change the culture is to involve the people you want to change in designing and implementing the change effort. I mean, after all, we're talking about inclusion here. So when you involve people, they will better understand why the change is needed um, and will be more vested in ensuring its success. So they'll better understand what's required of them um, and they'll be more committed to taking action. Instead of being recipients of change, they'll become actually probably more like drivers of change. Um, and because they understand uh, the work and the current systems and the processes, that they'll, they'll have good ideas on, on the best way to implement changes needed to support the new, the new culture and the business strategy that, that, that leadership's looking for. Um, so you can come up with the best strategy in the world, but if the people aren't prepared to implement these strategies, they're going to fail. So, so simply explaining the change won't work. If you only train people without addressing the underlying attitudes, the implementation definitely uh, is not setting itself up for success. So in, in terms, you know, I mean, it is very hard to do to change culture. It's a, it's a, it's a, big, it's a big topic and a big undertaking. So in, in terms of where to start, what I would suggest is, um, first and foremost, senior leadership must be aligned and truly supportive of the change. Um, it's not not just with lip service. They've got to look at their own behaviour and whether they're role modelling uh, inclusive values. And, and generally speaking, there are there are probably three ways in which you can involve people to affect positive change. But the first way, and it's probably the way we tend to see most prevalent in most organisations, is what I'd just call cascade top down. So that's that's where each leader on the leadership team drives the change through their own part of the organization and then the leadership team as a whole monitors the progress of the entire entire organization the, the second one um, and, and this is the one i prefer actually particularly from a culture inclusive perspective is what i call cross company so so people from across the company would come together for a series of meetings to learn about the intended changes uh, and, and as an opportunity to canvas their views and ideas about making that change happen um, However, I'd say if those meetings were simply used as you know, one-way communication where the leaders just explain and answer questions and stuff like that, I don't think they're as effective. It, for me, really is about inclusivity and making sure that you are you know, genuinely uh, canvassing the views of a diverse population and community of individuals to try and arrive at the best possible outcome with the right level of support. Um, and, and the third kind of and final main way is what you'd kind of call... I don't, don't really know what you'd call it, actually, but it's, it's basically where you'd have a, a big chunk of the organisation, a big slice of the organisation that represents all levels and functions coming together um, under some kind of collaborative steering group where, where they can discuss potential blockers to change and, and a analyse what decisions need to be made in real time. And, uh, and those meetings would tend to be uh, represented by people that would be a microcosm of the company as a whole, um, again, it's not kind of the one that, the way of change I've seen work 
most effectively, and uh, uh, and it's not the obvious way for me. I think it's this this idea of inclusivity and involving people across the organisation for their views is, is probably the, probably the best 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 approach. But but ultimately, you know, the best approach for any organisation is going to depend on things like um, the resources you've got, you know, the time frames you're working to, um, and the, and the type of change you want to to implement as well. So. What I would say finally on this point was that whatever you decide to do and however you decide to approach the, the, the transformation, it, it's definitely a good idea to set up a specific change team that's representative of the organisation to, to design and facilitate that change process. But you need to remember that it's really important for senior leaders to be visible champions um, and drivers of that change effort. If there's a disconnect, that's when the, uh, the change effort starts to fail before it even begins. Finally, in terms of, of leaving your imprint, what would you like to be known for? I think on a personal level, I, I, I really love what I do. Um, ultimately, uh, whilst diversity and inclusion makes great business sense, we, we shouldn't forget that ethically and, and morally it's just the right thing to do. And I think, you know, w- w- with recent political events both here and abroad, we are in danger, I think, as a society of becoming more exclusive and intolerant of difference. And that's a real shame. I, I think that you know inclusion is a is a virtue that's absolutely worth fighting for. And if anything, recent events on the you know the political landscape have have made me and my colleagues even more determined than ever to help champion what is a what is a great cause. So, for me, I, I think you know it's personal diversity and inclusion often is. Um, uh, I love what I do, and it's it's the right thing to do for the right reasons. So, um, yeah, that's that's how I'd answer that one. Great. Thank you, Mike. For more information on the HRD Summit programme and other speakers, please do visit www.hrdsummit.com.